I am with you. I will keep you, and I will bring you back to this land. I will never leave you until I have done all I have promised you. Genesis 28. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all he has promised. Not one word has failed for all of his good promise, which he spoke by Moses, his servant. The Lord our God is with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us. 1 Kings 8.57 For the Lord your God is merciful. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. Deuteronomy 4.31 Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1 verses 5 and 9. Please stand with us and worship. Through the desert, glory and fire lit my path. You led me to the waters where all I see is death. But you, by your faithful hand, call me to stand, lift up my hand. See the glory of the Lord. What can I say? You are my God. Always patiently teaching me to trust in your love. Patiently waiting, I see your face 
When wars wage around me, you stand in your place. Oh, people of God, lift up your hands. See the glory of the Lord part the waters. Impatiently waiting, I see your face. When wars wage around me, you stand in your place. Oh, people of God, lift up your hands. See the glory of the Lord part the waters. Impatiently Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My God has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she would have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Isaiah 49, 14 through 16. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 20.
have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2. Jesus, I am thirsty. Won't you come and fill me? Earthly things have left me dry. Only you can satisfy. All I want is more.
going to go ahead and just sit in this moment. So would you pray with me? Father God, we just come before you right now, and we thank you for this holy moment. God, we do want to be the clay in your hands today. As you work on us, God, have your way in our hearts. Have your way on, in all the situations that have been plaguing us all week long. God, we surrender them to you in this moment right now. And we thank you, Father, that when we hand things over to you, trusting you, having faith, God, you can do more than we could ever imagine or desire. So thank you, God, that you're going to do something special in each one of us today through this time as we worship you, we get into your word, and you change our hearts just a little bit more like yours today. It's in your beautiful name, the name of Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Thanks for praying with me. My name is Donna Zangara, and I am the children's director here at Eastern Hills Church. And we are so glad that you gathered with us today, either in person or for those of you joining us online. Welcome, welcome. And we have a great worship experience. Uh, we've already started today, and I'm sure that you'll be blessed as we continue and journey on through. We wanted to ask you to just take a moment and let us know if you're here joining us in person or online. For those of you here, you can take out the connection card at some point during the service and fill that out and the, drop it in the box on the way out this morning. If you are watching online, there's many ways that you can connect to us through the Church Center app and through our website. Let us know that you have joined us. Let us know if you have any prayer requests or praises that you want to share or any ways that we can come alongside of you and help you in this week to come. We also want to encourage you to um, remember there's lots of different ways for us to give of our tithes and offerings. God is on the move. There are many awesome things happening all around us in the kingdom work, and we don't want to miss out being a part of it. And so you can go ahead and give online. You can um, give at the, the boxes in the back of the room and also through your church center app. There are so many wonderful things coming up that we want to um, invite you to be a part of. You can keep in track of everything that's happening through Facebook, through our website, online, and also at the Connection Center. If you have any questions at the end of the service, please head over there. And We have a team of people that would love to answer your questions. And I just want to tell you about the couple things that are coming up in preparation for uh, the most incredible week in history that we celebrate every year, and that's Resurrection. Resurrection Week, our Holy Week, and that is kicking off this Friday with our Easter Fam Jam. So Fam Jam is an interactive online virtual family experience, and so there's the directions of how you log on to our YouTube channel. It will become available on our YouTube channel starting Friday the 26th, this Friday. And so what does that mean for you? It means if you have a family, we want to make sure that you grab one of these swag bags. Inside of these swag bags are a bunch of items that help to make this experience come to life right in your home. So parents, set aside 35 minutes for you to have a shared experience with your kid and start an incredible conversation conversation of what Easter is really all about. We're going to talk about how God took broken things, messy things, and he makes something beautiful and wonderful out of them. When we see broken, he sees blessed. He sees a blessing. You don't want your kids to miss that incredible lesson. This is also something that you can, if you don't have kids or you do have kids, think about your neighbors. Think about the people around you, your nieces, your nephews. Who could you grab one of these bags for and go ahead and drop it off at their house and say, here is a family experience in a bag for you. Inside of it is also some things for families to continue the conversation long after Fam Jam ends on YouTube. There there is a resurrection egg hunt in here. There is a Holy Week devotional so that every day leading up to Easter and Resurrection Sunday, families are getting into the Word, having conversations, and prayer time to make the most of reconnecting with their family, their faith, and with God through that time. So we hope you take advantage of Fam Jam. 
We also wanted to um, invite you to all of the Easter things that are coming up. All our Good Friday service is on April 7th. Second at 7 p.m., and that will be a beautiful service starting to get our hearts ready for that beautiful celebration on Resurrection Sunday. And we have two services on that Sunday, the 4th at 9 and 11. We do need you to pre-register so that we are able to accommodate everyone who's coming, and we are going to be offering children's programming for preschoolers um, in, at both services that day. We still do need a few more volunteers to help make that happen, and so I'll be at the table after the service to give you in, more information about how you can help be on the team that day, making Easter a wonderful experience for everyone who would choose to come and find the hope of Jesus. We also have this Easter and many other Easter's we've done this where we have a chance for you to purchase an Easter lily. We want to adorn up here and decorate with um, these beautiful Easter lilies but it also gives you an opportunity to purchase an Easter lily in honor of someone or in memoriam of someone. Like I know my mom and dad were a part of Eastern Hills for over 20 years and every year I love to be able to get a little lily and put it in here in honor of them and the hope that we have in, in uh, Jesus and because of what he did for us on Easter Sunday. So there's information um, over at the Connection Center if you're interested in getting involved in that. And one of the things that gives us great hope is when we see a generation of children approaching us. So Pastor Pat's going to come out, and we're going to ask the Jacobowski family and the Fishione family to come on up as we dedicate two precious little girls today. So come on up, Cecilia and Olivia. It's exciting to do this as we, uh, yeah, welcome them, <laughs> please. One of the things that's exciting in the life of our church right now is just to see the next generation being brought up and parents who are faithful to Jesus Christ and desire that same thing for their children, and so they're dedicating them. Why don't you come on up here so we can see everybody a little bit better? That would be great. And uh, we got our big siblings along with them, which is really cool. You know, Jesus was dedicated in a sense. Uh, we practice not infant baptism, but we practice dedication of children. At the proper time, according to Jewish custom, Jesus was taken uh, to the temple. And, and at that proper time, he was presented before the Lord as a precious gift that was received into Joseph and Mary's family. And an offering was offered on behalf, just thanking God for his life. And so that's what we do here. Uh, the parents really, today is an act that the kids will never remember. They'll be told about it, but they'll never remember. But it's really an action on the part of the parents. The parents are dedicating themselves today to raise their children in the old way of saying it, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In other words, to teach them from a very young age what it is to know Jesus and to follow him faithfully every day of their life. And so we're grateful for these two families that are choosing to do that. We know the, the place that children, and we're going to be talking about this a little bit later, play in the life. Uh, and, and the faith life. In fact, Jesus said, unless all of us are like a little child and, and, and come to him in that way, we'll never enter into the kingdom of God. And, and so these children are teaching us something very special today. So Miss Donna, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, these young ladies and then okay. we'll dedicate them. All right. Well, this is Ramo and Ashley Fishione. And I've actually known these two precious parents since they were uh, in elementary school. So this is such an honor, right? And this is big brother Matthew over here. And we are dedicating Cecilia May Fishione. She was born on October 14th, 2020. And when we looked her name up in our baby book, it meant humble spirit. In Psalm 149.4, it says, For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. So we pray he crowns her with victory all the days of her life. Amen. Hey, Cecilia. Back this way, sweetie. <laughs> Hi. Do you mind coming to me for Hi, a minute? Dolly. Sure. How about that? Yeah. Cecilia May Fishione. I dedicate you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thanks, sweetie. Yeah. She's so good. Amen. 
And we have Olivia Hope Jakubowski. So this is Jenna and Jamie and big sister Eleanor. Yeah. And little uh, Olivia was born on January 10th, 2020. And when we looked up her name in our baby book, it meant peaceful spirit. Isaiah 26.3 says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Yes, yeah, so we pray our little Olivia yeah. trusts in the Lord all the days hey. of her life. Hey, Olivia. Hi, sweetie. How are you? I know I look funny. Yeah. How are you? Hmm? Okay. Olivia, Hope, Jakubowski, I dedicate you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. How about we pray? You know, Father, I thank you so much for these two families. I thank you for the way that they have sought you with all of their hearts and the way that they are raising their children to do the same. We just dedicate little Cecilia and little Olivia to you today, Father, just lifting them up, praying that your spirit would fill them even at a young age, <clears throat> that they would love you and pursue you with everything in them, and they'll follow the lead of their parents in doing that. And in doing so, Father, may you raise them up as mighty women of God to be used in whatever way you have foreordained for them to be used. And so we offer them and thank you for providing them as special gifts to their families and placing them in homes that know you and are seeking you with all their hearts. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you, sweetie. <laughs> Congratulations, you guys. There's that little Bible. Hey, guys, congratulations. Yeah, we praise God. Isn't that great? You know? As we prepare for the last message, turn to Matthew chapter 10. Well, we've been walking our way through this series called Radical over the last uh, several weeks. And uh, today is the last message in this series. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 10. Before we get there, I, I just want to uh, do a whole church announcement about something that's really close to our hearts. Um, as, as many of you or all of you know, we lost our dear friend and, and co-laborer, Pastor Dick Bennett, back uh, uh, some time ago. And this coming Saturday... Palm Sunday weekend, we're going to celebrate his life. So we're inviting everybody to be here to come do that. It'll be at one o'clock. The family, Phyllis and the family will be here to receive people from uh, 12 to 1. I don't know why I still have that on. Anyway. And no. Um, from 12 to 1. And so we encourage you to come and encourage her. She has since um, their, their homes in the process of being sold, which they were getting ready to move anyway. Uh, but she has moved in with one of her daughters, and, um, and so she's overall doing well. But it will mean so much for us to, to be here and to celebrate Pastor Dick's life, and we're looking forward to that time. Well, as we began this series some time ago, Pastor Justin laid this out as the goal that we set for this series, to take us back to the fundamental aspects of Christianity and challenge us to consider whether our lives are built solidly on the foundation of Jesus or on other things to take us back to that basic nature. During this time, as we looked at Jesus the radical, we talked about radical love for the Father and how Jesus said that unless you love me more than everything else, you can't be my disciple. And, and it put it into context to love the Lord your God first and then love everything else out of that. We talked about radical compassion for people, how we need to see people and truly get a handle on what's happening all around us. We talked about radical urgency for the mission, that there are at least 5.2 billion people in the world that do not have a meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ. And if they go into eternity, they will go into a Christless eternity. If that's the case, then there should be an urgency in our heart 
to have conversations and do all we can to expose them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We talked about radical giving of his resources, a recognition that everything that we have has come from the Lord. And so we need to be considerate of how we're using those resources, especially in regard to the poor around the world. And then finally, last week, we talked about radical abandonment to his calling and what that means to be truly abandoned in all things. Which shovel are you using? Which sword are you using for the sake of the kingdom? As we walk through this, when we, we speak about the radical life, something that's been kind of bubbling up in my soul over the last weeks as I've read the book, but it more as I've reflected on the scriptures, is this. When we speak of this radical life, I want to suggest that we could replace the word radical with the word normal. That this isn't some abstract, extraordinary kind of way of following Jesus Christ, but it is normal Christianity. By ta talk, uh, taking and uh, walking us through many of the scriptures over the past weeks, I believe David Platt has been describing for us the clear teaching of Jesus on how we should live as followers of his, especially as it relates to the poor and the mission of the gospel. But this is in stark contrast to the Americanized version of Christianity that many of us have grown up with, thinking that the reality of the gospel was around us when the reality of the gospel is to bring glory to Jesus Christ and let his glory be known around the world. That's really what the essence of the gospel is all about. But we tend to think about the appealing to the felt needs of people, and, and we find it challenging because we think God should pay attention mostly to us when we need to be paying attention to him. And I think that's why some of us have struggled. Some people in that other view of Christianity says don't ever say anything that would be offensive to people or challenge people because you might turn them off to the gospel. And I would suggest to you, I took evangelism class when I was in college, and I would suggest to you that if we follow that mindset, Jesus would fail evangelism class because what he said was tough, and that was the initial call. When you hear things like, unless you're willing to hate your father and mother more than me, you're not worthy of me, and you cannot be my disciple unless you take this task. Or to the rich young ruler when he said to him, I want you to go ahead and I want you to go home and sell everything you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. And when he walked away, if Jesus would have been following the other mindset, he would have chased after him and lessened things. But Jesus knew that unless his heart was broken from being a slave to his stuff, he never would truly come into a relationship with him. And so I, I believe that's where some of the struggle has come. What's amazing to me is that when we think about it, freeing us from the chains of sin and from the power of sin costs Jesus Christ everything. And to experience life the way he wants, it will cost us everything. But in giving up everything and repenting of our sin, we receive all things. And so the very thing that we desire is ours. It's there within our reach. But we have to do things the way God intended for them to be done. Listen, as we exit this series, what I don't want is a message left in our ears ringing that says this, we have to prove ourselves by doing something more and more and more through radical actions or we can never be a disciple of Jesus. I don't believe that's what the call is. The message that we need to hear, that we need to take to heart, is that this pursuit of Jesus in these disciplined ways puts us in the position of experiencing God's grace in a deeper way and seeing the power of God released in our lives and glory brought to him. In a recent article I was reading by Roy Hollenbach, it was directed to small group leaders and what happens in the midst of small groups like many of us have experienced during this series. He says this, as mentors like Richard Foster and Dallas Willard have pointed out time and again, the spiritual disciplines are not hurdles to be cleared by the serious student of Christ. The disciplines are practices that put us into position to receive more and more of his grace. The startling truth is that those who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus need more of God's grace than others who have no interest in spiritual growth. Richard Foster sets us straight. 
quote, grace is not a ticket to heaven, but the earth under our feet on the road with Christ. Grace saves us from life without God. Even more, it empowers us for life with God. It leads us to the normal Christian life. Now, recently, uh, Janelle sent us some pictures of Josiah. I think the guys have them, and, and we'll put them up here. But you notice that his face is a little messed up. In fact, he had some markers like these. Now, markers are just tools. But tools in the hand of a childlike person can get you something. And she sent these, and she said, hey, buddy, what's up with this? Why did you use the markers on your face? And he looked back, and he said, Daddy beard. <laughs> he took tools that were at hand and he wanted to be like his daddy. So he started growing a beard onto his face. I think that's so cool. You know, you get that? Scrubbed it off. What's he do? A couple days later, beard. <laughs> These are just tools. Markers are just tools in the hand of a child. Listen, the kind of disciplines that we've been talking about over these last weeks and what I'm going to be talking about with us today are simply tools. The question is this, will we use our tools in a way that helps us be more like our daddy? Or do we even have a desire for that? See, it's natural for a child to want to lovingly be like their parent. And these young ladies today that we dedicated, there's going to be a time they're going to be watching their mamas and they're going to want to be like their mom. Why? It's a natural thing. In fact, in, in Matthew chapter 10, look at what Jesus has to say. Listen to these words, verse 24. He says this, A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master, if the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more members of his household? How much more? Jesus is capturing what we've talked about here. Notice the little word in verse 25. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher or the servant like the master. It's enough. It means sufficient. It means that we should be content with being like our teacher or like our master. It's natural, it's normal for that to take place. That if you admire your teacher, you're going to want to be like them. If you admire your master as a servant, you're going to, be want, you're going to want to be like them. How is a student to be like the teacher? Let me suggest a couple ways real quick. In knowledge, you want to gain all you can. The scripture says that we have the mind of Christ, that as we take this and we learn this scripture, that, that it transforms our mind somehow. We begin to know what God knows. He brings to mind what we need to know. It's not that we'll ever be exactly like God, but we'll grow in our knowledge that we see the world from his perspective. So in knowledge, in identity, that when we go through baptism, and over the next couple of weeks, we're going to baptize like eight people. They're going to give their public testimony for Jesus Christ. In baptism, we are identifying with Jesus Christ. We're identifying with his death, with his burial, with his resurrection. We identify with him so that people look at us. They know that we belong to him. In goals, that, that a student should be like their teacher in the goals that they're trying to achieve, what they're trying to learn. And so we, we gain insight as we work towards the same goals. And so we're going the same direction. When you take all of those things together, it's enough. It's satisfying. It's, we are content with being like our teacher. And Jesus is saying it's just like that little child wanting to be like their parent. You see, God the Father has already ordained that if we are going to be followers of Jesus Christ, he's already ordained that we are to be conformed to the image of Jesus. We're to be like him. That's what Christianity is really all about, that it's about him, a focus on him, and us being drawn to be like him, a student like the teacher. You know, the best teaching comes through apprenticeship, 
That means walking with the teacher, observing the teacher and how the teacher does things, doing activities with the teacher, receiving opportunities from the teacher under his or her guidance, and then responsibly taking on that task given by the teacher and reporting back with what's happened and what's learned. And eventually we do as the teacher would do if they were there in that circumstance. That's what good teaching is all about. And isn't that a great description of following Jesus Christ, that we focus primarily on walking with him, observing how he's doing things, understanding his mind about these things. And as we do that, and as he gives us opportunities, then we flesh them out. We're the hands and feet of Jesus. The servant is to be like the master, he says. It's sufficient for that. How is a servant like the master? Well, I thought about several ways. In ownership, you know, servants care for resources as if they were the masters. You know what that means? When I park in the parking lot and I'm walking in, if I see paper on the ground, what do I do? You pick it up and you throw it out. Why? Because we own this place. This is a place to bring glory to the Lord. And so owners will pick it up. Other people will walk by it and say, isn't it a shame how trashy they leave the property? <laughs> we didn't put the trash there, but owners will pick it up and servants will make sure that the owner's stuff is well cared for. In attitude, servants represent the master and are expected to use the same tone. When you think about the servant that went to find a, a wife for Isaac on behalf of Abraham, he went in the name and in the spirit of Abraham. And so when we're walking along in life, we are to be people that are representing the attitude of Jesus Christ, who did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for all of us. In contribution, servants help the cause of the master. They're pushing forth the agenda of the master. In generosity, servants use the resources of the master to accomplish those things. And just as the master is generous, so we are generous. Again, these are the things that we've been talking about over these last weeks. Now notice that Jesus says after this, if they call the head of the house a demon, Beelzebub is a term of demonology. And Jesus was accused because he cast out demons of being a demon himself. And he says, if they call me that, how much more the members of the household? And so we don't like criticism. And, and when we talk about radical Christianity, there's been too much talk in here. Jesus has talked too much about persecution that may come and, and, and all these things. In fact, if you paid attention to one of the last videos that Platt did for the series, he, he talks about how any of us that have given up parents and, 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 and things in order to follow him will receive more. And you notice... In the midst of all that, I, I, I got tickled when I listened to all this. How much you'll receive more of mothers and brothers and sisters, along with persecution, and then he just keeps going on with the rest of the list. Now, why do you have to throw that in the middle of all that? Because he's telling us, and if you notice, and Platt makes the point in there, notice that he didn't say, Father. Why? Because we all have one Father. And that Father is overseeing all. But we will, we will have so much more brought to us. But we will have persecution because they persecuted him. If they treated me this way, they're going to treat you that way. But three or four times he says this, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. In fact, as we read down through the rest of this, look. Don't be afraid of them. There's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, verse 26, or hidden that will not be made known. There's nothing hidden that will not be disclosed. So when you're concerned that what people are doing behind the scenes that are critical of Christianity or are evil, don't worry, it'll all be brought out into the open. In fact, he says this, there, what I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. And what is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roof. He said, look, I want you to stay in relationship with me. And in the midst of other people doing these things behind the scene, I'm going to tell you a message to proclaim that will shine light in the midst of all of that. In fact, here's a, a thought that's been going through my mind lately that I wrote down and I share it with you for, for encouragement. 
Results flow out of relationship and not out of outward reformation. Results for us as believers, power is released out of the relationship. He says, what I tell you in the dark, what's that mean? You've got to be spending time with them away from the limelight. It's not about what you do outwardly. It's about what you're doing in connection with him. So when you are having these private times and, and following these disciplines of being with him, then out of that relationship, what I whisper in your ears, I want you to proclaim loudly once you're out in the open. The results will flow out of what we get with him, not us being busy to do things outwardly for him. We will get there, but that flows out of being with him. So he says, don't be afraid that things won't be brought out into the open. Second thing, physical harm is not as important as spiritual death. He goes on to say this, verse 28, don't be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Physical death is not the most horrific thing. None of us like it. We're not seeking it. But he said the issue has to do with an eternal death, not just physical death. We will all physically die one day. But he says, don't be afraid of what they can do to your body. That's not your eternity. The third thing he says don't be afraid of is just when you think in terms of all this, I was having a discussion with our discipleship group the other night, and when I say the word discipline to you, what do you think of? Hard work? Punishment. Most of us think about punishment. When life gets hard for us, what do we think of? Why is God punishing me? But I want to suggest to you, the word discipline is not always, in fact, most times, is not associated with punishment. It's about the processes we go through to discipline ourselves. It's the hard work we go through to achieve something. And it doesn't matter how you apply that, that's true. If you want to learn, you got to th go through the discipline of reading and learning and studying. If you want to achieve things physically, you've got to go through the disciplines of those. And in light of that, he just says, look, as you walk through this, as you're walking through disciplines, don't see the hardships of your life as if God is punishing you. In fact, he says this, looking at value. And the statement I would put is this, your value is eternal and it's beyond anything on earth. He says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And the very head, uh, hairs on your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. Are you, not, you are worth much more than those sparrows. Your value is amazing. And God wants to use you in this normal Christianity as an object of his glory so that people could truly see him for who he is and know that they are valued as well. That's what we're here for. And so as we come to the end of this, he is suggesting that we go through an experiment. And I encourage you, if you haven't read the book, get to the last chapter and go through the experiment. I want to walk through the experiment real quick. He suggests that you do this for a year. In fact, I love the one statement that he says in the book when he says this, what if long-term benefits are actually reserved for long-term commitments? What if long-term benefits are actually reserved for long-term commitments? Don't talk big, start this, and three weeks later say, nah, it's not working. That's not how it works. Give it a year. Be honest enough to commit for a year. And as we walk through this, you're going to find that it's not as hard as what you think, but it will take some discipline. Again, not a discipline to try to achieve our salvation, but a discipline within the pursuit of our salvation, of truly knowing and loving Jesus Christ with all of our hearts and what we will achieve out of it. The first one is simply this, pray for the entire world. You say, how in the world do you do that? Pray for the entire world. Pray for God's glory to be spread throughout all of the earth. That's what we've talked about throughout this. In Matthew 9, 38, compassion led to prayer. Do you notice that? 
when he saw people and how they were helpless and harassed and, and going around like sheep without a shepherd, he didn't say, go do something about this. He said, pray, pray. So we begin with prayer. He mentions Operation World. You can get there at www.operationworld.org. Operationworld.org. It is a website that's, that's there. It lists all the nations of the earth. It, lives, it, it lifts up individual concerns or needs that are in those things. And you can begin to use that as a tool to begin to pray for all the world. Let me suggest something. Parents, what a great opportunity for you to begin to expose the minds of your children to the whole world. To go ahead and get them out of their own little world, our own little world, and to begin to think beyond that world. I encourage us to do that. It may be that during that time as you begin to pray that God will lay a particular country on your heart. Or you'll find that your company either does business or could do business in that particular country and God could use you through your work in order to be an impactor in that world. I don't know. But I, begin, I believe that as we begin to pray for the world, God will put the world on our heart. The second thing is read the whole Bible in the year. Did you hear the word? Whole Bible. That includes Leviticus. Read the whole Bible. Word for word. Genesis 1 to the end of the Revelation. Listen, there's all kind of Bible programs out there, and if you look at the Church Center app we use and have tied in with the U version, it has all kind of reading plans that you can use, but they get through the whole Bible. I encourage you to read through the whole Bible. Do you hear something emphasized here? The whole Bible. And I agree with Platt when he says, it would be better for you to labor through Leviticus than to read 10 more self-help books. Because they cannot change you, but the word of God will change you. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove the acceptable will of God. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I could go on and on and on of the value of the word of God. And you say, well, you say that all the time. Yes, I do. I strongly encourage you to read through the whole Bible cover to cover. Each year at the beginning of the year, we put out these, these, these potential reading plans, and I encourage you to, to check that out. Why? If you and your family will just do these first two things, truly daily pray for the world, and then get into the Word of God every day and discipline yourselves to do that, you will not be the same person a year from now that you are right now. That's not because I believe in us. It's because I believe in what He has said and what His Word will do for us. The third step is this, in this experiment. Sacrifice your money for a specific purpose. Sacrifice your money for a specific purpose. I love the story Platt told about the family that was discussing radical giving, and they asked their six-year-old if he had anything that he would be willing. We're, we're not even close yet. Not yet. <laughs> I thought I need to be hurrying, but I don't need to be hurrying that quite, not quite yet. Uh, give me just a couple minutes. When we talk about sacrificing your money, I love the story when he talks about the family that was talking with their six-year-old, if he had anything that he'd be willing to sacrificially give away. And he said, yes, his Xbox. And he's, the dad said, that's great. I'm so proud of you, son. How about tomorrow morning we'll sell it and go give that money to the poor? And he goes, oh, no. How many of us are willing to say, yeah, we'll sacrifice, we'll sacrifice. Okay, then let's take this and we'll sell it and give to the poor and give it. Oh, no. But I encourage us to truly say, okay, let's take some resources and be very specifically uh, specific in the next year so that we can identify something and give sacrificially toward it. For example, if you want to make a difference in the life of several people, become a child sponsor with compassion or world hope because every time you care for that child, you're caring for all of their family too. And that $40 a month, you, you won't even know you're missing it after a while, but you begin, and because your money investment is just the first piece, you also begin to interact with that child and be able to make a difference in the world. 
or like our OCC boxes. Every one of them impacts seven people. You could have a big impact that way. Or maybe you'll focus more locally on the Buffalo City Mission. Here's uh, some of our folks. Let, let me hold that to the next thing. You may, you may be doing something else, but take your money and find something specific to do. Let me get to step four. Spend time in a different context. Spend time in a different context. Yesterday, some of our folks were downtown at the Dream Center. We have those pictures, guys. And they were giving away food and caring for the, the hungry. And as they were down there, I love this. One of the guys said, the Lord just spoke to him that morning and said, hey, you know what? If somebody asks for your shoes, give them your shoes. And so this guy came prepared with an extra pair of shoes. Guess what? While they're giving out food and praying for people, a guy asking for his shoes, he took his shoes off and gave them to him. Another guy asked another guy for his sweatshirt. He took it off and gave it to him. He said, but you're going to be cold now. He said, I got the blood of Jesus flowing through my veins. I'm good. You see, when you put yourself in a different context, or, or maybe you'll go with Rick Foley and, and go down with the Congolese congregation and hear some of their stories about being refugees and what it's like. When you put yourself in a different context, you begin to see the world differently. And so I encourage us, maybe you go serve in a, a soup kitchen in, in, in the city or the mission or somewhere else, or maybe you'll go on a short-term mission trip in a different culture or, or maybe you could serve as a coach for FCA in one of the camps or something that's happening in the city. Or maybe you go to give kids the world in Orlando and see what it's like to care for a family whose son or daughter is dying and they're getting like a last wish. Or maybe you can go attend a service in an inner city church like Grace Church or Elam Fellowship. But expand your mind and heart beyond your limited experience and take your children with you. When our kids were young, they were with us in Jamaica as we ministered to people there. They went with us to Israel. We tried to get them outside of our little context so they understand that there's a God who loves the world. And because of that, he gave his only son. Fifth step is just to give your life to a multiplying community. Be in touch with this community of believers. There's so much going on within the life of our church. I don't have a clue of everything that's going on. I don't think anybody does. But our hearts here in this building of people and those of you that are online with us still, who will give glory to the Lord and make his name known that around the world, that means we do life meaningfully together, where we support each other and spur each other on toward love and good deeds, as it says in Hebrews. Other people living normal Christian lives or radical Christian lives. Some of us are not engaged in a small community of believers, a small group or a ministry team where you're both supported and held accountable. I strongly encourage you to get engaged in that way. As the team comes out now, you're welcome to come now, Nancy. I just want us to take it back to Josiah. If you could throw this picture up again. I just want to ask this question as we end this series. Is it on your heart to be like a little child? It's enough for us to want to be like our Father. And if we're going to be like our Father, then we're going to walk through the same things that Jesus did. So will you take these simple tools that I've talked about today, the simple tools that are at your disposal, and are you willing, are you desirous, there's the first part, are you desirous even to say, you know what, I want to be like him. And in being like him, I understand that as I focus, not on what I'm going to do for him, not on trying to do 10 more things so that he'll say I'm okay. It's not what it's all about at all. It's a matter of being in intimate relationship with him using the tools that are available to us. And as I do that in this experiment over the next year, how will my life be different? This has spawned questions in the hearts and minds of people that I am so thrilled by. And I don't know exactly what he's going to do out of all of this, but I believe he's going to unleash immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine if we will just be like little children and seek to be like him. 
Father, in these next moments, I just pray as we sing this song, stir our hearts. Holy Spirit, I'm not telling a specific thing that we have to do except to seek you because you've got to do the work in each of our lives. Just as you worked individually with that rich young ruler and other things, you put this out there for the general populace and you said, I need you to wrestle with these things. In these next moments, help us to wrestle, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Acts 2, verse 17. Spirit sound, rushing wind, fire of God, fall within. Holy Ghost, breathe on us, we pray. As we repent, turn from sin, revival embers smoldering, breath of God, fan us into flame. Cause we need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. For hearts that burn with holy fear, purified in faith and deep, refine as fire, strengthen what remains. So we the church who bear your light, lamp of flame, city bright, king and kingdom come is what we pray. We need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. A holy anointing, the power of your presence, pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. I love the reflection of that. 
In John chapter 3, Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, and he said, you know, you, you see the wind, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it came from. You don't know where it's going, but you see the effects of it. And Jesus said, that's what it's like for people that are followers of mine. You know, that's what I believe God's doing in our midst right now. He's blowing a spirit and he wants to see it unleashed. And we won't be able to explain it except for one thing, the glory and the honor and the power of Jesus Christ living in and through his people. It's an awesome picture. You know, as we close, uh, I want to pray for us. But don't forget, today is the last day. If you're interested in Easter lilies, um, make sure you stop at the Connection Center about that. But tomorrow night, here's another really neat thing that's just kind of being birthed here in our midst. Uh, our worship arts department is going to be hosting a, a worship training hub. If you have gifts in the area of worship and, and you would like to, to consider being a part of that, then come. It's from 6 to 9 tomorrow night. And um, come and be a part of that training. It's, uh, it's going to be looking at all aspects of worship. If you have friends, especially those that lead worship in other churches, we're, we're trying to broaden this to be something that is helpful to all of our area churches, that we, we just want to be a hub where we can do some training that will help grow in our worship of the Lord. You know, Father, I, I thank you for meeting with us today. I, I pray that we will take up the challenge of the experiment. Not lightly, not just saying, oh yeah, but truly give ourselves to it for a year. Because in doing so, I believe our lives will never be the same. But it won't be just our lives. It'll be the life of our church as you continue to blow your wind through people in unique and different ways that are not controlled by us that lead, but is controlled by your spirit. And so I'm anxious to see what all takes place in the days ahead for your glory. And as we approach Easter over next week, I, I pray that you will just draw people to yourself because we're going to lift up Jesus. And you said if we lift you up, you will draw people to yourself. And we look forward to hearing stories of salvation. So honor yourself, Father. Bring yourself glory. Help us to live normal Christian lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you go. Pour your spirit out. Pour your spirit out. Pour your spirit out. Pour your spirit out. Pour your spirit out.